Welcome to Locked On Golden Knights. Pete Bohr is fired. Who is next in line as VGK's head coach? More coming up next. For Locked On Golden Knights, your daily podcast on the Vegas Golden Knights, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi again, everyone. I'm Tony Cardasco and at Lockdown VGK on Twitter and now on YouTube. And of course, Chris Golick at TD Chris G on Twitter and otherwise. Chris, a very eventful day in the history of VGK yesterday. Pete DeBoer, the second coach to be fired over the course of five years. So two coaches in five years in the five year history of VGK uh, when the team released him of his duties on Mondelli McCrimmon just go through Lou Lamorello's script uh, that entire statement when he comes up with well we need a new voice in the locker room I just think he was reading things verbatim there uh, the Lamorello actually send McCrimmon the script I can't say it was a surprise All along here on our locked on show that uh, DeBoer was on a thin ice pardon the pun but we have talked up to Boer. I want to be with the players. I felt, again, throwing him under the bus during those exit interviews. And I think that's where it all began. And again, they started to evaluate a little bit more, a deeper dive into the Boer. And then finally, that led to his firing. Yeah, Tony, uh, definitely a lot to process. And if there's one thing I've learned about this offseason following the trot situation and obviously following VGK, it's the power of these exit interviews that take place at the end of the season. Uh, because I think that's a big part in what the general manager takes to the president and what the president takes to the owner. And then they process all that information. And decide is our current coach the right person for the job or should we get a new voice and it's a very interesting strange evaluation process and my concern as an outsider is you're only gonna take what's at the end of the season it's emotional they didn't make the playoffs who is going to go into that exit interview with McCrimmon and say it was a really good year. I'm really proud of how things turned out. No, it, it's going to be negative. And sure, DeBoer is the coach. He is responsible once the clock starts ticking on, on game nights to have that team ready to go. So he's going to get the attention. I, I don't know if it was the right decision. I'm sure we'll get more into that. Um, but yeah, those exit interviews, I think, play a key role in not just what happened in Vegas, but also for the Islanders and, and elsewhere. Yeah, the first half of this season, Pete DeBoer did a really good job with the players that he brought up from the AHL, despite all of those injuries early on. But again, things that did in Pete DeBoer, the failure on the power play unit. We knew that the assistant coaches would have to go, and now all but a couple gone. Uh, 0 for 17 failure on the shootouts. Uh, the lack of physicality, I think, was something that we really needed to point out, and we talked about that. Uh, during the course of our past episodes, this was definitely too much, I felt, of a finesse team and one that lacked identity. Okay, but whose fault is that? Well, there we go. I mean, we could start rolling there because, it, yeah, yeah it, I mean, everything should point back to Kelly McCrimmon, again, involved in the hiring process, or as he says, process, and everything, you know, across the board with the way that they handled uh, the scan and any coach that comes in here is going to have to deal with that. So a, a big thing that I've been trying to do is just, you know, kind of formulate just a simple yes or no. Was this a good decision to fire DeBoer and was it justified? And we put up, um, we put up a poll on, on our locked on uh, Twitter handle and it was simple. Are you going to remember Pete DeBoer as a coach that was that lacked creativity, 
struggled with the power play and creativity? Or are you going to remember him as a coach who brought us to the conference final or equivalent of the conference final in back-to-back seasons and then had bad luck? I thought it was going to be 65-35 leaning against Pete DeBoer, you know, lacking creativity and identity. But I just checked the results of uh, the poll. It was 52-48. It was an even split. So I think there's a little more compassion for Pete DeBoer. Um, Trying to put on my owner hat right now. How do I define success when I'm evaluating my product on the ice? Back-to-back final four appearances. Back-to-back final four appearances. And then 500 plus injuries and man games lost. How is that DeBoer's fault? I get the power play, I do, and that is a big, big thing. I certainly understand the power play needed to be better. I think it would have been better had the injuries not been there. Again, 11 or 12 goals, Tony, separated us from being like the 25th or whatever ranked power play unit we were to being a top 10 unit. I'll put that on injuries. I do believe that DeBoer extensively worked on that with the team. I think the power play would have been better. Would have been better. So I know this wasn't the question, but um, I honestly am feeling letting DeBoer go was not the right path for BGK. And I think troubled waters are ahead. Yeah. And to me, though, you know, no one at that press conference, not one question about the system, which I felt was his undoing. Uh, because the system, again, we just can't we can't say it enough. Just antiquated, didn't work. So DeBoer is let go. Assistant coaches Steve Spot, Ryan McGill, also relieved of their duties. And then the assistant coaches Ryan Craig and Misha Donskoff, they remain with the staff. So it's got to be someone coming in that has that connection with them. And the goalie coach Mike Rosati also has an opportunity to interview with the new head coach. So we did the pros and cons, right, on this show about DeBoer. There were more cons, though, than pros. And I went back to notes from the players from the final press conference from last week or a couple of weeks ago now. And something that Max Pacioretty, Chris, said really stood out to me. He, You know, whose fault and responsibility is it when Pacioretty says, you know, down the stretch that they played with 11 forwards, He said VGK previously had rolled four lines. He said our identity on that fourth line, you saw them start games for us year after year, and especially at the T-Mobile Arena, he said they had a bunch of big guys, big bodies running around, getting the crowd into it, banging guys into the glass. We did not see that. He said that this is our identity right there, playing fast, playing for each other. When guys have to play more minutes, You can't play the way that you want to play. It's just impossible. A lot of finger pointing going on. Is that on management again, or is that on Pete DeBoer? How can that be on DeBoer? DeBoer does not, his, he has the players, he chooses a lineup. He has his 12 forwards, his six defensemen, his two goalies. And then he picks that lineup based on what's available with injuries, salary cap. There was even a short taxi squad this past season. So he's going to take a group of 18 players based on what's available. If there's only 11 and 7 available or sometimes, you know, 11 and 6 because they couldn't fill a full roster a couple times this season, that's not Pete DeBoer's fault. That is on Kelly McCrimmon who I'm surprised the only thing he didn't say uh, was that we're not a salary cap, but we don't have salary cap problems. I'm surprised he didn't put that out there at some point. Um, But, you know, DeBoer can only deal, work with the tools that he is given. What big bodies did he have that were physical? Kolasar is a physical player, fine. Carrier is a physical player, fine. And that line four for both periods was awesome. That's not Pete DeBoer's fault. I'm not judging DeBoer based on anything outside of what he, what his results and his tools he was given. Yes, we failed to score big goals and big occasions in both of those final four runs recently. Sure, let's put that on DeBoer, fine. 
but I'm taking at face value that he did what he could to improve the power play, not just him, but along with his coaching staff. And I still truly believe that things would have been better with a healthy roster. I'm buying George McPhee's comments. I am buying George McPhee's podcast. I felt that podcast and the way he stated a lot of things that he did was a vote of confidence for DeBoer. But then when you watch McCrimmon a week and a half prior during the exit interviews, I I felt that uh, the writing was on the wall that at that moment DeBoer was gone and maybe there was a change of heart in the last you know nine or ten days from the exit interviews to uh, McPhee's podcast. So McCrimmon said that this is a team and an organization that is looking towards next year. And it's nothing about the past. They just feel that they can build everything up during a true offseason. Okay, I get some of that because they have played now the equivalent of three compressed seasons, and it is about next season. Uh, McCrimmon said that he looks in the mirror. He said that he's accountable. But one thing, the timing of this firing, okay? Gerard Plant, Ryan Reeves are getting a ton of publicity. We've talked about it on this show before. There's no way, I told you, there's no way Bill Foley is going to just sit back during this offseason without garnering headlines. Do you feel, though, with the timing, it, it has to do something with Gallant getting a ton of publicity in New York? I do. There was a very interesting question, and forgive me, I don't recall uh, who asked it. I know it's important to cite, but there was an important question that was asked yesterday. If you know who it was, uh, feel free to, to put it in there. But it was along the lines of, is there any regret now when seeing you know the success Gallant is having with the Rangers and what happened in Vegas with DeBoer being fired? And the response was, I don't know how we look at Pete DeBoer as anything but successful over his three seasons in Vegas. Fine, okay, I'm, I'm okay with that response, but it definitely did not answer the question whatsoever. And the, the timing obviously is terrible, but I don't think they're, you know, trying to take anything away from Gallant and what's happening. I mean, you know, what a that was an amazing series. And if you're down 3-1 to one and come back to win against a multiple Stanley Cup champion with a lot of the same players that have been there during those runs. You know, the, the coach gets a, gets an attaboy for that, and Gallant's doing a great job. And DeBoer did a good job. And, you know, just going back to it, the Golden Knights were in contention for the division as late as mid-February. They were on top of the division on and off. And then just the wheels came off, back to what you said not being able to roll four lines, players playing too many minutes, players playing additional minutes in spots they normally don't play. That's not a Pete DeBoer problem. And now looking ahead, which I think is what the ultimate segue is here, this roster for the last three years has been built to assist Pete DeBoer's system, whatever that may be, but Pete DeBoer had a system and the players that are on this roster now, not all of them, but largely in part, especially your, your role type players, are based on Pete DeBoer's style. So now we are going to rewrite that script with a new coach. And can the new coach make the current players, can it all gel and harmonize and everything that's needed for a successful Stanley Cup competitive roster which is now our expectations here in Las Vegas. Um, I saw the ultimate meme I put out there on my personal uh, uh, Twitter. The Golden Knights have successfully taken a championship caliber team and made it an expansion team in five short years. They sure have. Trust the process, bro. Trust the process. I think now that hot seat shifts to Kelly McCrimmon. Kelly McCrimmon, that seat has gotten even hotter, and I feel as though... McCrimmon's eyebrows, they definitely need their own Twitter handle, for sure. Uh, and that was Willie G. Ramirez who asked that question from the Associated Press. Uh, Kelly McCrimmon said BGK had not started its coaching search yet. We have reason to believe that they did. Who is next in line for the BGK? And is this a good job to turn down on the future? More coming up next. You are listening to Locked On Golden Knights. 
Well, summer is coming, and with summer, it's going to be a big time. You're going to need to get some food on the go. Built Bars are the perfect snack. You should take them on your family vacations, along with the Gallic family. Everyone is invited on their vacation spree. And you can throw them in your bags, in your kids' backpacks. Make sure that everyone has a bar so that you are fueled for your summer adventure. Chris and I, Chris, uh, have you devoured all of the birthday cake Built Bar puffs? Are they all gone? It's, it's perfect right before I start refing a hockey game. I always get a little uh, a little hungry, especially between games, and it's uh, just just a nice little energy boost to get me through and not have me on edge so I don't call them a million penalties because I'm because I'm hangry <laughs> for sure and those puffs they come in crazy flavors we told you about the uh, the birthday cake that we had delivered to our homes banana cream pie even churro who doesn't want a bar that tastes like a churro only 140 calories sign us all up and, and don't forget that they have the mixed box as well with 12 flavors and of course that includes marshmallow marshmallowy puffs, I should say. Uh, compare anything to uh, a candy bar that comes from Built Bar, 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, 17 grams of protein. Go to Built.com. You could find all of your favorite, uh, favorite Built Bars there. Go to Built.com. You can use the promo code LOCK15. Get 15% off of your order. Use the promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. Welcome back to Locked On Golden Knights. Thank you for making us your first listen. For your second listen, check out the Locked On Now podcast. You have nightly recaps of every NHL game as we head to the Stanley Cup, along with analysis from our local experts. It's free and available wherever you listen to podcasts. Tony Cardasco and Chris Golick from Las Vegas. And I am starting, Chris, to believe that now, according to sources, I have a really good source that told me that the the players, perhaps Pete DeBoer was fired over the weekend, or maybe it was even yesterday morning. I know that you said uh, maybe he was fired a week ago or so, but according to my one source, he called the players on Monday, and uh, the, uh, McCrimmon called the players on Monday to alert them that they would have a new head coach. So they were advised of this at the same time, I think, right before it was released to the public. So some of the coaching candidates that are out, out there, of course, number one at odds of one to five, I would say, uh, Barry Tr uh, Rick Tockett is out there, Joel Quinnell, John Tortorella. Um, I saw some other names. I saw on a few occasions even Derek England. Uh, but Trot still has to be the favorite. And that name that the – I don't believe that that would be good. Uh, and a, a name that fans, you know, I think believe in most, Travis Green was out there, the former Vancouver Canucks head coach. So is this a situation of Barry Trotz or bust? I don't think it's Barry Trotz or bust by any means. Um, just kind of going backwards, Travis Green, let's, let's look at Travis Green's last season. Starts with the Canucks gets fired, Bruce Boudreau comes in and gets them a heartbeat from the playoffs. So is Travis Green the right person for for a team that is competing to win now? No. Does he have a very bright future and he had a long, long career as a player? Sure, he can definitely uh, do well, but we need someone now that can get this team going. Um, I'll start with Joel Quinville, and I'm only evaluating him as an on-ice player everything else that other people can evaluate that. But you look at what he did in Chicago, the type of rosters he won with. Those rosters were not defense first type teams. Where I'm, Chicago is originally where I'm from, huge Blackhawk supporter, uh, you know, outside of EGK. And a lot of speed, a lot of skill on those teams. And there was some physicality, but more speed, more skill. Um, Barry Trotz, defense first. Barry Trotz is a very sexy name. He is a very, very sexy name. I think he wants a little more control than VGK is willing to give him. Um, if it's not Barry Trotz, I'm at the point where I'm okay with that. Rick Tockett is very intriguing. Um, he was an assistant in Pittsburgh during the Stanley Cup runs. 
He was with Arizona, and they technically had a playoff appearance with the bubble. Um, I'm not going to evaluate his record with an Arizona roster. That's just, you know, not very good. Um, worked his way up, obviously, as a player, grinder type. Um, he's got some fire on the bench. We've definitely seen that in his time with Arizona when things weren't going his way. So I wouldn't mind, I would not mind Tockett. I would not mind Quinville. Uh, Paul Maurice is another name I've seen pop up. Uh, I like Paul Maurice, but you know him and uh, him and uh, DeBoer are very, very close buddies. So I don't know how that would play out during the interview process. Um, trying to think, who else do you mention? Oh, uh, Tortorella. Jeez, I, I would I wouldn't mind Tortorella because he's no best. He's not going to accept any outside influence. Um, but I think they're going to look for a coach where they can have, VGK that is, where VGK can have influence over, over some things. Remember, Gallant was not a yes sir type. Gallant was, this is my team once the game starts. I'm going to put the roster out there that I feel is best. And I think that is partially what did him in in his uh, two and a half, two and a half, that's not the right way to say that. Halfway through season number three, when he was like, oh, after a measly four-game losing streak. Yeah, and to me, again, one of the reasons why Pete DeBoer lost his job, I felt that he lost the locker room. He did, because when you go back to all those exit interviews and all the comments by the players and the tentativeness kind of stands out in my mind, and players, again, just knocking the entire uh, – just, just this system that wasn't very effective. Uh, I felt that, you know, this was headed in that direction where we were going to see DeBoer get fired. And the reason why this team, I feel now, cannot build sustainability, using a McCrimmon word, is because of the front office. The front office just cannot get away. Now, will this become a job? that is a good job to turn down. I started thinking about this yesterday because two coaches, five years, is this one of those jobs that you just go, I don't know that I want to work for that front office. Any coach in any professional sport, any of the big four sports is simply a means to an end. There are very few coaches that are, you know, five years or longer in one with one franchise. So I don't know if any coach out there is going to go through the interview process and then turn down VGK. There may be some people where, you know, McCrimmon starts getting tires and they could get a very polite no thank you, I guess that could be. And there could be various reasons for that. But I don't think this is going to be a job that any... NHL coach fears. Any experienced coach is going to look at the roster. They're going to see a bunch of veterans and a high payroll, and they're going to see opportunity to win now. Any up-and-coming coach, a Travis Green type, is going to say, wow, the limelights of uh, Las Vegas being on the strip and all the attention that it gets, I think that's a very appetizing position for that reason. Going a bit farther, and there's things that we're, we're never going to hear um, about you know what types of phone calls are made from the general manager and George McPhee down to uh, the coaches. We're never going to get to sit in any of those meetings. I mean, I'm just very curious how much influence there is when uh, when uh, DeBoer wa was now formerly when he was uh, on the whiteboard, you know, writing down the, the line combinations and such and the scratches, and then all of a sudden you get the. Ooh, sorry, I shook the camera there. That was not an earthquake, folks. But you get the you get the knock on the door. Hey, coach, how are we looking about this lineup tonight? You know, kind of going back to the movie Moneyball, the um, the general manager and the coach, uh, all the push and pulls they had about the rosters and such. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, they're trading away star players so they can get uh, the other players out there. I, I don't think it's that big of an influence, but you know, McCrimmon does have a extensive coaching background too. Keep in mind. He coached VGK uh, during uh, the bubble or during last season, I think, when DeBoer was out for a little bit. So I do think there is uh, some outside influence. I think uh, it is now always going to be a pressure situation for any coach that comes in. 
but I don't see too many coaches turning it down because A, it pays well, uh, and B, just the attention that it brings, especially if you know Vegas does go on a deep run uh, in the short, you know, short future. And I still have to believe that Pete DeBoer is marketable out there to be a head coach again and might pick up if he wants to, to be a coach as soon as early as next season uh, with the job opening. And Kelly McCrimmon, to me, um, he is currently riding Jack Eichel's coattails. Okay, make no mistake about it. As Eichel goes, so does McCrimmon's job security. I really do believe that. Do you agree? What, what 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 do you mean as far as like Eichel goes and and how if that Eichel pro, can, I mean, I, if Eichel can lead this team to the playoffs next season and he's like the marquee you. guy because I felt that McCrimmon was all in on Jack Eichel. No, no doubt, Tony, and yeah, you're you're a thousand percent right. Um, Jack Eichel is going to be the face of this franchise. That's um, whether that happens immediately or a year or two from now. But this team is being bred for Jack Eichel to be the leader, whether it's captain or assistant captain Eichel, you know, whatever. But Eichel is going to be the face of the franchise, which has some dangers to it. You know, I mean, you you can't not acknowledge how he's looked upon in Buffalo for some regards, but I do feel he can shed that skin and become that leader that VGK wants from a skill perspective and an off-ice perspective as well. He has enough leadership around him who are going to show him the way as long as he is a sponge and willing to soak all of that in. And I truly believe Eichel will become that player. Yes, we were all in on Jack Eichel. And you have to wonder if the plan, I mean, the plan always is to win, is to win now, fine. But realistically, could they have won now with Jack Eichel in his current form. I think they probably could have as long as they made it to the playoffs, not just as a seventh or an eighth seed, but you know they got in those top three seeds in the Pacific and then went from there. Unfortunately, injuries and such changed that, and Eichel needed to be the player they want him to be about halfway through next season. They needed that now, and that just was not possible based on his return to health and then based on him uh, breaking his thumb, unfortunately. I think that the next head coach will be seeing Chris a lot of concessions before he even starts the position. Again, you have to have Eichel as your centerpiece, okay? And then you have to pair him up with players, as we know, that are going to be fit into that same style that he plays. And so I think a lot will be around Eichel, some of the other concessions, the identity piece. Again, do you build a team based on speed? Do you go with the players and the athletes that you have? Do you go out and try to uh, to get and to find some physical pieces uh, for for this franchise? I think there's going to be some concessions already when a new head coach comes in that that new head coach is going to have to face. With the new coach comes identity. And Pete DeBoer, I believe, tried to establish an identity for his first you know, season and a half with us always starting line four, and he was rolling all four lines. Obviously, this year that was not available, but with the new coach comes identity. Now, looking at the VGK roster, this isn't a a roster where you're just going to go up on the whiteboard, cross off this player, cross off that player, and here's your list of free agents, here's your list of HSK, and, you know, just kind of find a roster and make it work. That's not going to be the case. There are many unmovable pieces on this roster. Uh, whether it is the salary, the output, or a combination of both. So you're going to see largely the same roster that we had this year, minus a few pieces that they need to do to work in the salary cap, and whether there's more players like Logan Thompson being traded to make way for uh, some salary space and such like that, uh, a possible you know trade involving Riley Smith before a free agency opens up to alleviate that salary cap. Dodonoff is obviously a target right now to shed that salary, but who is going to pay some of these players the salary they are currently earning to move them off the VGK roster? That's the big question. So a new coach, yes, I want to see how they can come in and just take all these pieces and make them work. Um, Barry Trotz in his first year with the Islanders was very successful. 
Um, Pete DeBoer actually had success as a first-year coach with a new franchise uh, with deep runs on two different occasions. So could a Joel Quinville, who has all that experience, come in and just take this roster, you know, minus whatever uh, little tweaks that uh, need to be done to get a salary cap compliant? Uh, Paul Maurice, you know, Barry, uh, the, Barry Trotz, um, Rick Tockets. Like those are all names that I'd be really curious to go back and do more research on their first year going into a new team and see how they adjusted. I know Trotz has had success. Um, Tockett went to Arizona, so we'll just move on from there. Uh, Maurice, I know, had a lot of solid runs with Winnipeg. Couldn't get him over the hump. But a lot of solid, deep runs, always a tough team to play in the playoffs. And one thing that we knew is that Robin Leonard and Pete DeBoer could not coexist. We could talk more about that in a couple of minutes if you'd like. But I felt that if DeBoer stayed, Leonard was going to want to be on that trading block. And when we return, we'll talk about Mark Stone headed for back injury, uh, for back surgery, for that back injury, I should say. You are listening yeah, he's headed for a back injury. If Brett Burns sat on you, on your back, you'd be headed for back injuries and back surgeries. More after this on Locked On Golden Knights. Our partners at Bet Online continue to be the number one source for all your sports betting needs and sports information. Find all the latest odds, news, and sports development, including this year's NBA playoffs, the NHL Stanley Cup playoffs, Major League Baseball scores, fights, UFC, boxing, all of that, and even next season's NFL futures. Bet Online is your continued source for all of sports wagering information, from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. I'm going to take the Rangers at plus 170 for the next series. Thank you so much for those odds. Bet Online, where the game starts. Welcome back to Locked On Golden Knights. It's free and available wherever you get your podcast. Tony Cardasco and Chris Golick from Las Vegas. Mark Stone, who missed 45 games this past season, is with the doctors in Los Angeles this week and probably, according to Kelly McCrimmon, headed to have back surgery. McCrimmon hinted a couple of weeks ago, and it appears now that Stone will undergo surgery on Wednesday and hopefully they say he could be back by the start of training camp. Shout out to uh, my good friend John Nordahl, who has probably the best NHL and hockey jersey collection on the planet. Maybe one day I'll get him on the show. We can talk about that. But um, we were just chatting last night in our VGK uh, nerd group chat, so to speak. And his quote was, the Golden Knights future rests on the back of Mark Stone. No pun intended. There's a lot of truth behind that because a healthy Mark Stone leads this team on the ice. He leads this team on the bench. He leads this team in the locker room. He leads this team in practice and off ice and is visible in the community. You know, Mark Stone right now is the face of the franchise in that regard. And I hope everything is well with his health. That's first and foremost. I hope, um, I think the plan was as early as tomorrow for surgery pending uh, some additional opinions. And uh, DeBoer, or excuse me, <laughs> dollar in the swear jar. Um, Kelly McCrimmon said that um, he should be ready for camp next year. I hope that's the case. I hope he is fully healthy. We need Mark Stone on the ice for 70 games plus. Um, if we have all that salary, you know, tied up in injuries, although maybe maybe he'll get injured and he'll sit for the last 60 days and we'll do another big trade. Never mind. We saw how that all turned out. But I hope Mark Stone is out there fully healthy, has a great season. A healthy Mark Stone is the first piece that needs to fall into place for another successful uh, for a successful season six. Mark Stone on LTIR to start the season. That's minus 180 whether he's injured or not. They're just going to continue to play these stupid games with the salary cap, for crying out loud. And <laughs> Mark Stone, uh, you know, again, that team leader and someone that you need in the locker room, as you mentioned, and he was injured in the second game of the season. I thought that it might have been a leg injury. It was his leg, his back. He was ailing the entire season. 
they did try to get him back in the lineup. Either he wanted to come back for that final push or maybe they were pushing him to get back, so to speak. When you have back you know, injuries, your back is never the same. Like even after series and what have you, uh, I'm just wondering about the durability in the future, you know, uh, of Mark Stone. And maybe maybe he goes to Jack Nichols' doctors and they can fix him up. Yeah, I mean, I don't have experience at, at the, um, a high uh, quality competitive level, but, you know, I do skate probably four or five times a week as a referee. And uh, I had a, a coming to a Jesus moment last night, a puck coming probably a good 70 miles an hour just right off my shoulder in the back of the neck but it skimmed me thankfully but a couple inches this way a couple inches this way an inch this way that we uh i might have been on uh, ltir depending uh how the outcome of that would have been but my point where i'm going with this is after i skate i'm sore the next morning i'm kind of walking a little sideways as uh you know the juices start to flow and such and these guys are competing at such a high level but they also have the best doctors, the best research behind them. A lot of money is spent on this, but you know, sure, back injuries, um, groin injuries are just a weird thing as far as recovery time goes. Are they ever the same? Maybe, maybe not. So I think that's a player dependent. I don't believe Mark Stone prior to this season has had a history of back issues. So that's a good thing. Um, just thinking back to um, uh, my, supporting the Blackhawks a long, long time ago. Eric Daze, uh, real tall bodied forward with a very good scoring touch, uh, but just back issue after back issue, couldn't be on the ice. And I certainly hope that's not the path that Mark Stone is on. And back to Pete DeBoer for one final comment. And again, I said he lost the locker room and I said going into the break, it might've caught you a little bit off guard there. We ran out of time, but there's no way that Robin Leonard and Pete DeBoer could have coexisted in the future with this franchise. Who are we kidding here? I don't know, Tony. I'll I'll give a little bit of pushback there. Um, these things happen in sports. These things happen with coaches. They happen with players. I'm sure uh, DeBoer has a list of players he's not been completely supportive of. I'm sure players have lists of coaches that they clashed with, but... I think you put that stuff aside. I mean, Pete DeBoer was the one who had his name engraved in that sword in the back of Marc-Andre Fleury. So I, I do believe that DeBoer was a big supporter of Robin Leonard. There was damage done this past season. And I don't believe Robin Leonard's exit interview uh, with McCrimmon, whenever that happened, was that favorable of DeBoer. But, you know... The attention needs to go on Leonard a little bit. I mean, I'll say this again. Leonard injuries. He tried to do it. He tried. Things weren't going the way he wanted to. His performance lacked. Every one of us knew that. He gets pulled from, at the time, our most important game of the season against the Capitals. Um, uh, well, Logan Thompson comes out there and uh, you know saves the game. They win the game. And all of a sudden, Leonard says, F this. I'm going to have my surgery now. There needs to be a little more accountability on Robin Leonard to maybe explain his mindset there because I take that as he's turning his back on the team. That's truly the way I feel. Now, could he truly just have not continued? Was he just that hurt to the point where this put him over that edge? A hundred thousand percent, that is fair, but the optics of simply saying, okay, you don't like the way I'm playing, I'm gonna get my surgery, see you next year. I don't like that. And your guy, Logan Thompson, I know you are a fan of Logan Thompson's, uh, but uh, Logan Thompson with that unbelievable save in the oh, World Championships, that was ridiculous. And he's just starting to come to his own. And it's there's going to be a good battle coming up in camp for the starting goaltender. And Bersois is going to go away. Oh, no, that's right. Logan Thompson will probably land wherever Pete DeBoer is because VGK is going to trade him. He's not going to start for VGK this upcoming season. Logan Thompson, I mean, <laughs> that save shot. was the optics of that save were flurry esque in the sense he dove all the way across. But I still say, I said it more or less to poke the bear, but I, I still believe it was about a 60 40 shot that 
that goal, that puck was not even on net. I think it hits the side of the net, but, you know, still, awesome save. And let her, hello, good morning. Logan Thompson is going to be an amazing player. He was an amazing player for us this past season. I just think the uh, the bus is too crowded for Logan Thompson to stay with the organization. You're not, Leonard's not going anywhere. Brassois not going anywhere. I mean, if they're going to try and move a piece, Brassois is the one I would like to see him move, but I just don't see anyone taking that salary on. Maybe someone does, and then it's a one-two of Leonard Thompson, and however that works out through the year, fine. Um, I love Logan Thompson as a player. I hope he's a member of the team. I just don't necessarily think it makes the most sense to improve the roster by keeping him when they can possibly utilize him as bait for something else. As Kelly McCrimmon might say, trust the process. Trust the process. We will leave you with that. Coming up on tomorrow's show, the latest in the coaching search for VGK. And I don't believe that they're just starting it now, okay? Let's leave it at that. But we'll have much more tomorrow. Maybe we'll get into those numbers we were going to talk about today about VGK's uh. front presence. We can talk about that and much, much more coming your way. Uh, once again, thanks for making Locked On Golden Knights your first listen it is free and available on all platforms and once again for your second listen make sure that you check out locked on nhl from all the second round matchups now my rangers are still alive to each stanley cup kiss on nhl covers the playoffs like none other here are all the latest news all the opinions from local experts monday through friday and it is free and available wherever you get your podcast from las vegas i'm tony cardasco along with my, my man chris Gollick. We'll see you once again tomorrow right here on Locked On Golden Knights. Take care.